I think we're going to reconvene or we're going to have people drifting in here, I have a feeling, but um, uh, we will have session three uh, moderated by um, by Brian Gemmel, who's uh, vice president of National Grid and the uh, the president of Wires. Uh, we uh, we would uh, probably need to close the doors. But one thing I want to mention to you is we'll have a short break after this session, during which time we'll have dessert. So, you know, that little, the little sugar trying to get you to stick around for the full afternoon. And uh, so uh, you can expect that. We'll have dessert outside uh, at the end of this uh, panel. Uh, Brian, I'll just turn yep. it over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear clearly? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh, well, welcome back uh, from lunch. It was very delicious. The Canadian Embassy has done really well with catering, so uh, uh, kudos to, to our hosts. Uh, it's been, been wonderful. So we've, got a, we've talked about uh, uh, development. We've talked about uh, renewables. And this, this afternoon's panel, we're going to talk about technolo technology. And we have a very distinguished set of uh, uh, panelists. You have the bios uh, in front of uh, you. We're just going to do a little bit of uh, just name and title. Uh, we have a couple of presentations that are going to use some slides, uh, and others are going to just do opening remarks. The plan would be then to, uh, we've got some prepared questions, but we'd love to hear from you all. Uh, in the audience uh, with questions, so we'll, it will take plenty of time to do so, but we'll, we'll get the initial opening comments and some slides over, hopefully within the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, okay? So with that, uh, and we're sitting in order, so I'd first like to introduce Carl Imhoff, who is the uh, uh, Energy and Managed Directorate for the Pacific uh, Northwest National Lab, the DOE of Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. So. Carl, we're going to hand it over to you to kick us off. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it, uh, Jim and all. Um, they gave me five minutes to give a little bit of context about the scope of all of the technology going on on the federal side of, of efforts. So I'll just speak a few minutes. I'll share with you uh, a few of the drivers that I think are having the most impact on the federal investments uh, right now. And there's about four or five hundred million dollars investment broadly across grid modernization. So some impacts. I'll share a little bit of what's going on uh, in terms of grid modernization and North American energy resilience model and energy storage. And then I'll close with sort of my sense of three really important outcomes that entities or collaborations like this, I think, could, could really contribute to. And then I'll follow up with the questions. So in terms of big changes, um, most utility folks would agree that the transition from coal to natural gas over the last five years has been a profound uh, reshaping of the whole energy uh, space. Uh, and in addition then a dramatic increase in variable generation. Uh, nothing new in terms of the news there, but I, I, I think that the key that it's driving on the federal side is the need to think about not just energy supply, but also the issue of system flexibility and how do we handle the increased variability of generation, do it in a time when there's less system inertia because you're dropping some of the large coal plants and other things. And so how, how do you actually ensure a, 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 a flexible system for the future that deals with not only the blue sky day needs of the nation, but also the dark sky needs of the nation, the power system. Demand has been flat for the last three to five years. Uh, I know last year, this past year, just actually started tweaking up again. I'm sure that's good for, for all the folks who are in the rate of return business. Um, but it's driven an awful lot of re-examination of business models, and that's been a big part of what uh, the DOE has been invested in, in terms of looking at valuation and, and metrics and other things for what's changing in this whole marketplace. Uh, it's phenomenal though in the West, uh, the energy imbalance market, they expect by 2022 that have over 70% of the major utilities involved in the EIM market. So that's a market-like emergence and in an in interconnection that has a very thin amount of actually structured markets. So that's, that's a big driver. And something that Terry Boston, it's all his fault or a large, to, large degree, system observability has just been overwhelmingly transformed in the last decade. In 2003, when we lost uh, the Northeast, we, we, Terry and his uh, colleagues thought it would be great if we had 300 network PMUs to help watch for over the horizon issues. We've passed 3,000 network PMUs. They're driving down into the distribution system now. 
Uh, ERCOT has 95% penetration of uh, smart meters. Uh, I think we're at about 75% nationwide in terms of smart meters. So system observability is, is it just transformed both today's practice and the possibilities for tomorrow, new paradigms for control and other things. And that points to an emerging issue, and that is this notion of uh, better dealing with extreme events. We've all heard about the, you know, a lot of people have had 500 year events in the last three years, that sort of thing. Uh, this whole notion of leveraging system observability to better handle system extremes is a really important driver in terms of the work that DOE is doing. So let me talk about DOE just briefly then. The three, three big pieces. One, the, uh, their grid modernization initiative. It's about $350 million a year that DOE invests in across the entire DOE uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, Bruce Walker, who was here last night, uh, is, is a strong driver in the North American energy resilience model. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, some recent investments in energy storage. From the grid modernization standpoint, uh, they are building public platforms, open platforms on foundational uh, activities that we think can help the industry drive and, and, and accelerate its transformation activities. That includes things like planning tools that handle the degrees of uncertainty, both in distribution and transmission that we need going forward. I mentioned to Jim earlier that it's hard to talk about transmission because the boundary between transmission and distribution continues to erode. And you really need to look at that, that integrated uh, activity. Uh, observability at even higher levels of, of resolution than phaser measurement units going to point on wave for being able to do certain incipient failure uh, detection in the system whether it's wildfires or other things emergent control approaches that address the drive to go to much more distributed activities across the system and to deal with that digital explosion much of which is now is getting to be outside the actual ownership boundary of the utilities themselves. How do they maintain situational awareness and control with a lot of the evolution at the grid edge? Predictive tools that help you get more asset utilization out of the existing transmission and, and invest smarter for new transmission. Uh, artificial intelligence is a major drive looking at anomaly detection, whether it's for cyber or for real-time operations or other things. And then lastly, storage. I, mentioned, I, started, I mentioned flexibility up front. Uh, storage we view as a real fundamental degree of freedom for delivering the degree of storage we need at some of the decarbonization levels a lot of states and regions are talking about, and DOE's made some major pushes there. So on North American Resilience Model, uh, Bruce's team is working on uh, both uh, planning tools uh, that, that mainly provide the capacity for DOE to better understand uh, the, na the nature of certain events so that they can better answer the question of is it, re is it uh, appropriate to declare an emergency, uh, a grid emergency declaration as part of the FAST Act or not, and to look at very quickly at uh, na national or interconnection scale contingency analyses to identify where there are certain risks to the system, how to mitigate it. For this group, I think that's important because those tools are going to help uh, uh, the government work with industry to help identify where the system needs to be reinforced and that gets into sort of the infrastructure investment activity which includes wires or other things. So let me just close with a couple of big outcomes then to draw off some of these. This, this notion I think of looking at how do we deliver system flexibility investments that are robust across a range of energy futures. We're working on grid architecture right now as part of GMLC and there's a, a high DER future, a high resilience future, a, reveal, a future that looks at the convergence of urban uh, convergent networks, a uh, future that looks at a, a big push towards distributed activities which is fractal grids, network microgrids, etc. How do we ensure system flexibility across those range of energy futures because each region is going to be different and none of us really know what the future is going to be yet. So I think that's one important outcome to think about. The other is enhanced planning for future architectures. I mentioned those five that are coming out of some of the DOE work. But to do it in a way that better handles extreme events. The National Academy, which Terry was actually involved in, talked about the industry needing to be more aggressive and expansive about the types of outage scenarios that they need to consider when they're looking to invest in resilience. Uh, and I think uh, as we get more variable generation, uh, changes in inertia and other things, we need to be a little more expansive in our thinking in terms of what are the, the outage scenarios we need to be prepared for. And then lastly, the notion of advanced control. We have to be able to control uh, at scale, at the grid edge, uh, all the distributed activities plus the traditional assets. 
And part of that is using all the new smarts and system observability for adaptive protection, which is much more efficient and probably much more productive. And then lastly, this notion of we're putting this huge infrastructure out there of inverter-based resources, but we really don't have a coordinated strategy for how we're gonna leverage those inverter-based resources on dark sky days, as well as on blue sky days. So these are some really important outcomes as we're thinking about investment in wires and everything else that goes into the system that need to be considered. Thanks. Well, thank you, Carl. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Charlie Smith, uh, who is the IEEE Life Fellow, Executive Director of the Energy Systems Integration Group. Well, welcome, Charlie. We've got some slides here. Bear with us one second. Okay. Thank you, Brian. I'm uh, kind of a cross between the last session and this session. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, technology, a little bit about renewables, and a little bit about process. I'm with the Energy Systems Integration Group. Many of you probably remember us from the Utility Variable Generation Integration Group, but we're looking across uh, energy systems now, not just across uh, wind and solar. So really the challenge of the future is to get wind and solar into the electric system and then get it out of the electric system into the gas system and the other fuel systems and into heating systems and transportation because the real challenge at the end of the day is decarbonization. So <clears throat> I thought what I would do is just take a little walk through the large wind integration and renewables integration studies that have been done over the last 20 years and uh, see what they what insights they have for us, see what they tell us, particularly about the need for transmission and about the critical role that transmission plays in the future of the electric energy system. So going back to the probably late 90s, early 2000 period, you <clears throat> saw the addition of transmission to the RPS requirements. In a lot of states were putting up RPSs of 5, 10, up to 20%, I guess, back in those days. And uh, you never saw anything about transmission in the early RPSs. And then after a few years, the uh, state legislatures or the regulators started asking the utilities, well, how come you're not hitting your RPS targets? And they said, well, we're, we're having trouble with transmission. We can't get the, the renewables from where they are to where they need to be. So after that, I think you started seeing states, whenever they talked about RPSs in the legislature, they also talked about transmission and improving the uh, transmission planning, permitting, paying process. So that was an interesting revelation. And then individual utility studies followed by ISO studies in, in the early days, all the, the ISOs, uh, New England, New York, PJM, MISO, ERCOT, California, SPP, they all started doing wind integration studies at low levels, then up to high levels, and lo and behold, with the higher levels of penetration, they kept seeing they needed more and more transmission to minimize curtailments or to move the energy. Those early studies were followed in the 0708 period by the ERCOT CREZ study. Remember that? It was, uh, I think, it's been around 3,000 miles of right away and probably a six or seven billion dollar investment to handle 18 gigawatts of wind in ERCOT. And then the 20 percent win by 2030, it was led by DOE with a lot of assistance from AWEA in the industry. I'll, sh I'll show you a map of that, uh, that transmission plan that many of you will probably remember. <laughs> and then moving on to the 2010-2011 period, Western Wind and Solar Integration Study Phase 1. There are actually four phases of that spread out over the, about a five or eight year period. And, and then the EWITS, the Eastern Wind uh, Integration and Transmission Study, which looked at the Eastern Interconnection. Once that was, was underway, then the REF study, the Renewable Electricity Future Study that NREL did, which looked at increments of 10% up to 90% of uh, annual energy from renewables in the US, kind of settled in at 80% renewables as a, uh, a stretch but a feasible stretch and looked at the costs and the implications of doing that. Then a little later, 2014, 2016, the EIPC, the Eastern Interconnection Planning Collaborative, which developed transmission plans based on some of the work from EWITS, but really starting from the, from the ground up for 20 and 30% renewable scenarios. That's annual energy production again. Followed by Urgis, the uh, Eastern Renewable Generation and Integration Study. These were huge studies, by the way. They were multi-million dollar, multi-year studies. But each of them 
up to this time only uh, covered a single interconnection. And then around that time, the Pan-Canadian Wind Integration Study, which actually looked across you know, both eastern and western interconnections all the way across Canada, followed <coughs> by the SEAM study, which uh, has been bottled up inside a DOE for a little while now because of some political considerations. And then the NARIS study, which is underway, I think it was alluded to earlier this morning, the North American Renewables Integration Study, which looks at Canada, the U.S., and Mexico um, at high renewable uh, futures. And I also wanted to bring in just a little bit of the European experience with what's going on with ENSOE, the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Electricity, and just use Germany as one example of what's happening in Europe, followed by uh, China and, uh, again, Canada. So I'm just going to flip through these real quickly. Those of you who are involved may remember this as the AEP 765 KV overlay for the 20% by 2030 wind study. Um, it was kind of a, a crayon drawing of a transmission plan at the time that reflected what a lot of people thought might be required. The EWIT study, you remember these, uh, I think, depending on whether it was 20 or 30%, there are probably 6 to 10 uh, 500 kV HVDC lines east to west to move the wind from the central part of the country to the uh, to the eastern part. REF, REF was done using some NREL tools, which kind of were a transportation model, not a real transmission system model show. So it showed the highways, the beginning point, the end point, and kind of the width of the road. But again, a lot of cross uh, transmission east to west, northeast to southwest, or northwest to southeast across the central part of the country. The EIPC scenario one, it, it really did build on the work of, of EWITS, even though it was the foundation for the, the urges, but again, a common, common thread of transmission there. Uh, and an interesting point is that it couldn't be done just with the AC system. The AC system didn't have the, uh, the capability to move the, the amount of energy and the distance required, so they also had a number of HVDC lines east-west in there. And then moving to Europe, this is a, an interesting map of Europe uh, looking at new transmission lines. Those red lines you see are new transmission lines that are projects in permitting that are for the 2030 scenario. Europe, European Union legislation requires pretty much complete decarbonization of the electric system by 2050. So they're really looking ahead in 10 year, uh, 10 year time span to what's going to be required by way of a transmission, not only electric transmission, but also gas transmission to meet that uh, meet that vision. And then Germany, as you know, Germany has uh, decided to shut down all of its nuclear capacity and it's phasing out coal as well. A lot of that generation was in the southern part of the country. There's a lot of new offshore wind coming in in the north, so they've been uh, challenged with building new transmission north to south. They're also looking at HVDC lines, some overhead. I think they're looking more underground lately because of the uh, the uh, local resistance they've run into in trying to cite the overhead lines. And then China, anybody who's following what's going on in China, you've you got to be impressed with their UHV DC and UHV AC lines. I think they've got about 25 of them now, 1,000, 2,000 kilometers long, running from the northeast of the country to the southwest. It's uh, pretty impressive what they've done there once they made up their mind to do it. So a few of the key lessons that uh, I wanted to touch on is that the uh, sum total of all of these studies just continue to reinforce and build on the notion that uh, transmission is recognized as a key enabler to meet the clean energy goals. And with each successing, uh, successive increment of renewable capacity added, more renewables require more transmission. A lot of benefits from the infrastructure, which I'll get into in a, min in a minute. Also, I think a growing recognition that a balanced set of transmission and distribution solutions must be achieved. It's not all transmission. It's not all distribution. There's got to be some, some uh, happy medium of both. And one of the interesting things about Europe that, that strikes me is that the TNY, TYNDP is mandated by European Union legislation. The utilities of all those countries, are the TSOs, are required to enter into a collaborative transmission planning process to meet the goals of the European Union for a clean energy uh, future by 2050. I think there's things that we could learn from the way that was done in, in this country. So I, I've mentioned some of these lessons from the U.S., but <clears throat> one of the ones I want to 
say a few more words about is the transmission infrastructure and what it enables in addition to the low cost renewables balancing area consolidation. I remember an area of Texas where they're planning to put in 5,000 megawatts of wind into a 4,000 megawatt balancing area. And they said, uh, ain't going to happen. <laughs> so, so then uh, ERCOT consolidated their balancing areas and went from, you know, I don't know, eight or nine balancing areas to one. And all of a sudden, 4,000 megawatt project was no problem. Is that right, Terry? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And also reserves, uh, looking at ERCOT, reserve sharing and reduced reserve requirements. While ERCOT was adding their wind, every year their reserve requirement went down. People said, what's going on? They're adding more wind. Why is the reserve requirement going down? Well, two things were happening, really. One was the aggregation over a broader region, so they were reducing the variability of the, uh, of the wind. But the other was they went to a five-minute market. So with the five-minute market, they were balancing every five minutes, and they didn't have those uh, long, um, long time periods to deal with. So in indeed, the reserves they were holding did go down. ERCOT still gets, gets grief over that. Increased capacity value with greater geospatial diversity, that really showed up in one of the wind integration studies, where capacity value of wind in small footprints was in the 20, 25% neighborhood. And then the capacity value when the transmission overlay was added because of the diversity went up to the 30 to 35%. And when you get that kind of capacity value out of a resource like wind, then obviously you don't have to build as much of another another sort of capacity. Okay, um, this third bullet here is, is something that we've been talking about this morning, talked about at, at dinner last night as well. And th this goes back to legislation that was introduced 10 years ago in the Senate. I think it, it all died. It never went anywhere. Their transmission expansion, transmission planning bills. And there were three components that I think all three of the pieces of legislation uh, had in them. <coughs> One was interconnection-wide transmission planning, and I think that was uh, you know, partially addressed by FERC Order 1000. It was at least a step in the right direction. And last night, uh, Senator Heinrich of New Mexico mentioned that some new legislation might uh, pursue that agenda. And I think it's not only uh, interconnection-wide transmission planning now, but it's cross-interconnections even that needs to be done. So that's still a, still a work in progress. Regional cost allocation, I, I think some form of regional cost allocation has been adopted by most of the RTOs. It's not perfect yet, but it's, uh, it's moved a long way from where it was 10 years ago. And then the federal backstop siting authority, that's still, uh, still a work in prog progress and probably ain't going to happen real soon. The lessons from Europe, in addition to the T and YDP uh, being mandated by law, it was driven by the need for renewables integration. That's what was behind the, uh, the TYNDP. And there's also a, uh, an expectation that each, each country will have a 30% of its peak load in uh, interconnection capacity. And you basically have to tell the regulator why you don't have 30% interconnection capacity if you don't. It's kind of a presumed notion that you've got to move in that direction to integrate really high uh, levels of renewables. And as I said, the, the gas and the electric system planning, now they're doing coordinated uh, gas and electric system planning, which you could uh, learn something from that as well. And Germany, a good example of implementation in, uh, in real life of the long distance high voltage lines from north to south to move the offshore wind to where it needs to go. Canada and China, I think the Pan-Canadian Wind Integration Study and the NARIS are, are two great examples of cooperation between uh, the US and, and Canada. It really highlights the strong trade relationships that exist. There are strong north-south connections near the border, which enable uh, good trading. I think they're at least as strong or stronger than the east-west connections inside of Canada. And then China, um, China gets things done. <laughs> they don't always get it done in the uh, most, uh, most democratic way, but they get things done. I, I remember talking to a friend a few years ago in China, and uh, that's when their curtailment, they're looking at 40, 45% annual wind energy curtailment in the North Provinces. And I said, how, 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 are, you, how are you managing this? How, how did this happen? Well, you know, why, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, in the last five-year plan, the party said to build a lot of wind. So I said, we built all the wind. And I said, well, what about the transmission? He said, they didn't say anything about the transmission. <laughs> so I said, they're going to address that in the next five-year plan. So, so the next five-year plan, they addressed it with gangbusters and got what you see there now. 
Okay, I just want to close with the thought that uh, as we embrace the smart grid, let's not forget the need for the dumb grid. That's just the wires up in the air. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, next, we have Roger uh, Rosenquist, as Vice President of Business Development at AVB. And you have some slides. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Roger Rosenquist. I uh, work with uh, grid uh, issues in ABB, and uh, I uh, thought perhaps I give it a little different perspective and, and give you a little update on where where we are with equipment technology and systems technology and in, in, in transmission uh, to 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 address some of the issues that have been discussed here earlier today. Uh, so so when. When we start to integrate more uh, renewable energy and close down fossil fuel plants, we, 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 we actually cause some, some issues to the grid. Uh, fossil fuel based plants, many of them are located close to the loads and when we retire them and, and, and replace them with uh, energy coming from remote areas, uh, we, we create reactive issues in, in, in the system. Uh, the, the local generators are very essential to support uh, the voltage profile and the re reliability of the delivery. So, so when we close them down, we need to, to uh, replace them with something. And, and there is a new, uh, very good technology for that. Uh, we, we also, uh, when we uh, uh, turn down dispatchable generation, uh, we, we start to have bigger and bigger issues with balancing uh, generation and load. Uh, the, the, uh, the other issue is uh, we, we, we already have a lot of wind energy in, in the US. Uh, we uh, uh, also have quite a lot of uh, uh, solar energy. Uh, and the, uh, the most favorable conditions for, that, uh, for, for, for both of those renewable resources are in re areas that are generally far away from where the big load centers are. So we need, uh, we definitely need new transmission capacity to move that power to uh, the load centers. But uh, as we have heard here from many speakers earlier today, uh, it's very difficult to permit new transmission lines. And, and uh, especially if you have to go through areas uh, that really have no benefit of, of, of the line. If the purpose of the line is to bring renewable energy to New York, uh, people in between are not going to be happy to have a new overhead line there. So, so, so it, it, a lot of obstacles are raised against construction of, of a new overhead line. And unfortunately, there is some uh, very neat new technology available to address that also. Uh, we, we talked about hydro. Um, Hydro is very important uh, for, for balancing of, of load and power when you start to have a lot of, of uh, new intermittent resources. And Canada uh, already today have a lot of uh, areas that uh, are entirely uh, uh, hydro. Uh, examples are Quebec and, and uh, uh, British Columbia, for example, that, that uh, basically have all their electric supply uh, from hydro, and if you connect those resources to uh, uh, to uh, uh, areas with uh, more intermittent resources, you, you you can actually utilize these existing hydro facilities for 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 energy storage. So when you have excess uh, wind and solar, you export uh, power to. Uh, to those areas uh, that are normally uh, supplied uh, from hydro resources, save power, uh, save water in the dams, which translates to energy. And, and when you have a, a lesser uh, wind condition and solar conditions, you, you export that uh, 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 hydro energy back uh, to, to the system. So you essentially create a pump storage a system, but you never pump and, 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 and don't spend the energy losses on that. So, so Canada obviously has a tremendous potential in, in what is already built in Canada for interconnection to the US. 
But, but another important factor is that uh, they, they also have another about 160,000 megawatt of undeveloped hydro, according to uh, the Canadian Hi Hydropower Association. Uh, we have a lot of hydro in the U.S. also, but there is really nothing more to develop. Uh, uh, there, there are lots of sites with undeveloped uh, hydro, but the total uh, capacity is not uh, very high in those so, so, so there is definitely a big potential for efficiencies here by uh, having uh, more interconnections between uh, uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, we have uh, transmission issues if we start to integrate offshore wind in the Northeast. We, we have a big, big aggressive plans. Uh, by, by the state in the northeast, but uh, if you start to look at the existing transmission grid uh, where uh, the export cables from, from those offshore facilities will land, there is really no backbone transmission that can receive all, all that power. So, so if we look at New Jersey, for example, the, the backbone 500 kV system is, the, is in the western part of the state. So we have to develop new transmission to get to the coast and get the offshore power in. Uh, New York, the other example, have a long coastline along Long Island, but that there is really no backbone transmission system on Long Island. And, and I think nobody realistically believes that we're going to be able to site new uh, uh, high capacity overhead lines along the coast in, in, in New Jersey and, and uh, on Long Island. So, so, so there have to be other, other solutions. And uh, fortunately over the past uh, 20 years I would say there have been a continuous uh, uh, development of some very neat technology. Uh, we, we have uh, now cables uh, underground and submarine cables that can uh, carry up more than 2,000 megawatt in a single circuit. And, and, and that now gives you the flexibility then to, to, to underground uh, in, in sensitive areas and, and to use waterways for, for long distance transmission. Uh, and, and in parallel with that there have been a development of very powerful uh, uh, AC-DC converters with uh, that have high efficiency, low losses, and, and capacity that can, can match that. And, and uh, uh, the, the good thing about that is that uh, the footprint of converter stations have gone down dramatically. So they now fit in the footprint of a, of a major power plant that is being retired. So, so, so you can build new transmission systems underground into metropolitan areas and site the converter stations where there used to be a big fossil fuel plant. Uh, so so uh, th this opens up a lot of, of, of possibilities. You can build uh, new transmission lines entirely underground and, and what people most initially say, well that will be much too expensive, but, but if you build underground systems in rural areas, uh, it, 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 the costs are really on par with, with overhead transmission. It depends on geography, of course. If you go, go through mountains, it becomes more difficult, but uh, most of our uh, best wind resources are in the Midwest, and, and it's very flat and, and very easy to do underground construction generally. Uh, and and uh, you can combine overhead and, and, and uh, uh, overhead, uh, so you go underground in areas where, where people have concerns about siting new overhead transmission lines, and then you go overhead in other areas. Uh, so so uh, that also allows you then to, to build new transmission lines in the, the existing infrastructure corridor, so you can, you can site these cable systems uh, in existing overhead line right of ways along railroads. Uh, you can uh, do it uh, along roadways. And, and uh, you may ask them, why, why don't you do this with AC? Well, with AC there are some technical issues here. Uh, when, when you operate along underground uh, or submarine cable uh, with, with uh, a power frequency, you, you create very high charging currents that essentially use up the transmission capacity of the cable once you get to, to a certain length. But if you use DC technology, all of those issues go away 
and, and you, there is really no technical limit on how far you can go underground or underwater. It's just an economical issue. So, so a couple of, of pictures to illustrate what I'm saying. Uh, uh, th this technology has started to be implemented quite a lot in, 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 in Europe now. And, and what you see uh, to the right is installation of a very high capacity underground circuit in a rural area in northern Germany. It's actually offshore wind power that is coming in and, and then is uh, uh, routed underground into uh, a, a good interconnection point uh, in the existing uh, uh, German transmission backbone grid. And uh, I would say very similar to the, the type of issue that, that you would experience with offshore wind in, in New Jersey. And, and uh, if you're offshore, uh, you, you can lay the cable from a type of large specialized cable vessels that you see on the left side. So then in, in parallel with the development of the cable, there have also been uh, you know, some pretty s remarkable development of, of uh, HVDC converters. And, and uh, uh, what these converters can do is to uh, not only supply uh, and, and, and deliver uh, uh, real power, but they can also uh, provide uh, reactive power in the same way as, as, a, as a local generator. And uh, with continuous development in, in power electronics and in, in, in configurations of DC converter, you now have losses that are uh, down at 0.6 to 0.7 percent and, and capacity ratings up to, to 3,500 megawatt. So, so, so definitely uh, uh, suitable for, for uh, large-scale transmission. And uh, I, I already mentioned footprint. This is an example of a, a, a plus minus 500 kV bipolar station, a capacity rating of around 3,000 megawatt, and that can fit in a, a, within a footprint of 700 by 550 feet. So, so, so uh, uh, enormous development if, if you compare to, to all the converter stations like the Pacific Intertie uh, uh, out on the west coast. And uh, uh, the, 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 the funny thing is that the uh, PQ capability curve of, of these converters look very much like a, a, a local generator. So I put uh, an illustration, a diagram on the top is a typical PQ curve for, for, for a generator on, and the uh, curve to the bottom is, is uh, the, the similar characteristic for uh, one of these voltage source converters. And uh, uh, the, the difference is that the, the converter can send power both ways. So, 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 so it's a bi-directional transfer, but, but to the grid that they're receiving and sending, and it looks like you have uh, either a, 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 a local generator there or, or, or a local a motor load with voltage support capability. So, so uh, generally you can provide uh, the same amount of reactive, if you have a thousand megawatt uh, converter, you can supply five to 600 megawatts of reactive uh, power from it, and, and it's there both for uh, continuous and dynamic support of the, of the grid. And uh, uh, the other characteristics with these, uh, uh, this new generation of, of converters is that you can uh, actually use them for black starting a, a system also. So it's an improvement of, of grid, grid re uh, resiliency. If you have a blacked out area, you don't need any local generation in that area to black start it. You can black start it through the HVDC link uh, and, and generation resources at the sending end. So, so uh, I just want to give uh, a little illustration of, of uh, uh, how this technology has been started to, to be adopted in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, Germany has a, a tremendously aggressive uh, program for renewable energy uh, and, and uh, uh, Norway, uh, France, uh, 
uh, in Northern Europe have a lot of hydro resources. Uh, and uh, what has happened uh, recently here uh, is what you see on the map here. We, no we now have almost 50 HVDC connections in, in, in Europe. And, and you see a big concentration uh, up in, in, in Northern Europe. These are projects that are uh, either uh, already in service or currently under construction. And, and you see there are, uh, there are uh, high capacity links from Norway to the UK, from Norway to, to uh, the Netherlands, from Norway to Germany, and, and uh, then a whole bunch of of, of other interties as well. And, and some of these uh, uh, lines are obvious because they, they uh, 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 have cables installed in the sea, but you also now start to see a significant penetration of long overland uh, underground systems. For example, in, in, in southern Sweden, you have a very long line uh, coming down from uh, the mid part of the country to, towards the south. You have uh, interconnections uh, from France to, to Italy and from France to Spain built underground and from, from Germany to, to uh, Belgium. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to that, the technology, uh, because of its low footprint, this is now extensively used for offshore wind interconnection and, and with cables then uh, going far, far inland. And, and these converted uh, uh, are also useful for, for uh, other applications. Uh, you use them for statcoms, so you can supply reactive power uh, uh, with them. And you use them for battery storage to create uh, virtual inertia, if you like. Uh, you, you can support the grid frequency with, with energy stored in battery and, and, and uh, make it look like you have a local generator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Now I'd like to introduce the Doctor for Chris Clark. He's the founder and CEO of Vibrant Clean Energy. So I, my um, format's a bit more like Charlie's, um, but I want to dig into a few areas where, uh, from work that I've seen and, and done, um, it's kind of a cross between technologies, but also kind of um, how things are changing uh, due to the technologies that are coming online and how they might interact. Um, and what is invariant, um, one of the reasons I'm speaking here is that the invariant solution we keep finding is transmission, um, how it's used keeps evolving in the studies, but um, it's kind of a, an unsolvable problem, some of our uh, issues if we don't have uh, large scale transmission. So um, again, this, we, I don't get quite back as far as Charlie did. I'm just going back to 2012 to the, to the REF study uh, from NREL. Um, and for each one, I basically kind of noted that each one shows that um, transmission is needed. HVDC transmission is, is even better. Um, and when it says needed and, and better, what I mean by that is uh, for the same amount of dollars spent, you get higher carbon emissions and more reliable electricity um, when, you, when you add more of these technologies. And you move from high voltage AC to then DC um, gives you compounding uh, benefits. Um, my naive view of an HVDC line is basically you're just moving a remote generator to where you are and where you need the power. Um, and so when we do that, we add um, benefits, but there's also some uh, difficulties with that that uh, some of the latest studies hopefully will uh, uh, solve. Um, and so we go from the NRF study in 2012, which showed electricity generation up to 80%. Um, we then, uh, myself and colleagues at NOAA, did a study uh, that was in the peer reviewed journal Nature Climate Change that looked at a, nat uh, a national HVDC grid overlay, so a third tier onto the transmission system. Um, they kind of tried to look at using HVDC in a slightly different way to like that point source, moving it from remote to local. Um, and we actually found those uh, even greater benefits when you don't just have a captured organs or a captured 
uh, customer. If that customer doesn't want your power and you've just got one line going to them, uh, you don't need to provide them power and you don't make any money. But if there's a huge market, if they don't want it, someone else likely will. And that's particularly important for wind and solar because you basically don't get to choose when the fuel shows up. It shows up when it shows up and you either use it or you lose it. Um, and battery storage does change that a little bit, but I'll, I'll talk about how that doesn't really uh, gel with where we can site. Um, then we had the Urges study again. Uh, that was electricity. So these first three have been electricity only. Um, and we were looking at, uh, they looked at NREL, really detailed Eastern Interconnect study of, of how transmission is needed to be increased to actually incorporate more and more uh, renewables. Um, and they did it at quite fine granularity, which was really helpful to kind of see how that additional granularity might add difficulties for those uh, transmission links. Um, then recently last year, we actually put out a report um, which was centered on Minnesota, but we actually did the whole Eastern Interconnect. Um, but we actually, instead of just modeling electricity, we now we're bringing in electrification. And so what we did was we built on top of previous studies and said, well, hey, if we bring electrification in, uh, I've heard people tell me that that will mean that we don't need transmission anymore. We can just do everything uh, locally. Um, and it does change w w what we need. But unfortunately, um, for those people, transmission actually is more important because uh, it works in combination with uh, these different resources uh, because of, uh, as the first time I've ever heard this, dark sky days. Um, so I've got a new, a new phrase to be using a lot now. Um, where you don't have power locally um, being generated and you need to bring it in, but you've now got 30, 40, 50 percent of the economy relying on it rather than 20 percent. And so that's even more critical infrastructure that needs to get power to it. And so uh, transmission becomes a bigger uh, component of that. Um, and then uh, last year as well, the NRL SEAM study, uh, we saw a, a really good uh, description of that and uh, slides of that. Uh, hopefully we'll get a report uh, one day. but. We saw different designs that they went through, and they are going to step through, and I'll show them here, where uh, they looked at different designs of transmission, different upgrades that you could do, and it again showed that that HVDC overlay, uh, I think they coined macrogrid, um, Dale Osborne, I think, came up with the term macrogrid, uh, where they basically do an HVDC overlay uh, in the US um, and actually show uh, benefits and, and cost uh, savings. Um, and then there's a new study that we're bringing out hopefully early next year which I'll only touch on briefly, that we're, instead of just looking at the Eastern Interconnect, we're actually looking at the whole US um, with connections to Canada for their uh, free hydro um, import and exports to, to balance our renewables <laughs> in, in the US. Um, how we could get to 100% decarbonization of the whole economy by 2050 is essentially the, uh, the idea. But again, looking at it through the lens of how do these different technologies work together? So instead of thinking of you know, transmission, storage, and generation all being uh, separate things. How do they play together as they as they move in? So just to quickly go through the NRL refs. Um, it's a long time ago, so I just wanted to put up a couple of slides from it. Uh, so this is how much investment they believe they would need for their different scenarios, um, where we're getting to high uh, technologies of, of uh, high amounts of re renewables. Um, and you basically see you know, there's quite a decent spending on uh, transmission and a lot of back-to-back -back tie capacity as well. Um, but actually, that ends up always being around a two to three to um, benefit to cost ratio uh, coming out. And so this is something that um, Charlie also showed, kind of where the flows are going. Um, but again, you're seeing here, this study just did those line segments. So it was just going from A to B, and that's it, and then stopping. Um, what we did in the Nature Climate Change paper that we thought was a little bit different um, that was done in Europe before, but in the US, I think it was one of the first times to really uh, model it this way, is do a network. So these HVDC, instead of having one linkage, you have a new layer on top of the uh, markets that exist today, and then you can sell and buy power anywhere in the US using the HVDC links, basically transporting your generator to uh, remote locations. Um, we saw the same sort of flows that REST saw from the central plains to the southeast and to the to the coast as well. Uh, but we actually saw there being more resilience. So one of the things that um, I learned from uh, my military background when I used to be in the military is that the more dense you make your infrastructure, the more easy it is as a target. So the more power you put down one single cable, the easier it is for someone to come along and cut it. Um, and so with a network, you sort of avoid some of that issues because you can then reroute the power. 
um, using the network rather than having these points that are uh, large scale failure points. Of course, there's other ways of, of getting around it, but that's, that's one of the ways. Um, this is Urgis, and again, uh, they had the kind of system of pulling power from the central planes away to the, to the load centers. And again, if you can imagine some of these black lines, if you just cut one of those black lines, well, how, what would happen uh, to, to the power? Because there's no real networking uh, in there. And so when I then talk about sort of how these uh, technology interplay, that now electrification as it comes in, we don't know when it's going to come in exactly. This is just one example of ours of electrification coming in uh, to, to the grid over the next uh, 30 years or so. It stays pretty flat for a while, but then it starts really ticking up. Um, and what we find is that that electrification actually will drive the need for transmission faster than uh, the issues with supply that we have currently. Um, and what it changes is when we need that power. And so one of the big things is we all need power at different times of the year than we do now. So the way that we're using transmission will be different. We need it currently now to really have capacity when we've got the biggest, hottest summer days uh, to move the electrons. But for this, we're going to need kind of the opposite. We're going to need the coldest darkest days in winter where we're going to need all that extra heating energy, uh, EV power to get to the, to the load centers. And that's a different sort of way of optimizing for the system. So the Minnesota Smarter Grid, um, again, we found we needed transmission lines here. It's kind of hard to see, I apologize, but there's white lines, which are the state to state connections. So we went to a, a modeling uh, way of every state would have a DC tie to another state, at least one, uh, preferably two. And so then that would build up many bilateral um, sort of contracts, if you will, between each of the states that can move power and there can be almost like a tollway uh, fee for moving electrons across that um, to, to pay for the system. And that way we can allow any state to take advantage, both make profit and also uh, revenues, but also then build resources there if they wanted to tap into that grid. And this would be enabled by uh, the VSC technology or the HVDC light, as it's called. Uh, because it really allows you to mimic other generators being locally in your footprint without them actually being built there. So uh, this is a plot from that, which is how much transmission is built. So above the axis is basically how much you need to import into your state and below the axis is how much you export. And this is sort of the incremental build. And so the thing with building out the network is you can build it incrementally with the most profitable areas first and then go to the less and less profitable um, a bit like rural electrification, but um, just kind of a big scale uh, idea broken down into smaller pieces. So the NREL seam study really looked at different designs of this. Um, and they had four main designs and it, it went into really excruciating detail, which was amazing to see how they were going to try and layer these different uh, ideas together. And I'm just really going to focus on design three because it's the one that kind of really unlocks the biggest potential. Um, in terms of adding reliability, adding resource adequacy, adding resource diversity um, across the interconnections. But it's also a network. So design 2B is kind of similar to all the other studies you see. They have these point-to-point -point connections, and then it sort of just dumps power uh, at the end or pulls power from the end. Uh, whereas the network allows you to sell to multiple uh, customers and also buy from multiple uh, vendors. And so this is what the scenario ended up looking like. Um, and this again came out with a cost benefit ratio of 2.5. So back in 2016, we did ours and we found a cost ratio of three. NREL did much more detail. And so then the cost ratio went down a little bit because um, th they had other data that they were using um, and they were kind of missing certain areas like ERCOT I think wasn't uh, included. But as you can see now, instead of there being points to points, there's more of a loop. Uh, there is uh, sort of a, a, a weaker point, which is down to the Southeast. Um, but for the rest of it, there's that loop uh, nature that you could sort of ship power around. Um, and then we're talking about uh, large sums of money, um, but in the grand scheme of the, the amount that's being spent is, is very little. Um, so the one that's coming uh, out soon, this is kind of the super grid that the HVDC system that we uh, kind of con constructed in this uh, model. Um, so here we have actually two connections to every single state. Um, so we've got multiple points of failure. Um, and the thickness is trying to represent how much capacity is needed. Um, and we actually underneath this have the routing. And then underneath that, we have the AC system connected in. Um, and so the interconnect can stay as they are if they wish to, uh, but you can ship and buy, buy and sell power from anywhere. Um, and what ends up happening is the model starts building storage at the endpoints of these as well. Um, 
so that you can actually utilize the lines for much longer, but then also if you need to have them down for any time, you can mimic the transmission line being there as well. And then finally, this is kind of the whole country decarbonized by 2050. Um, and using an HVD supergrid versus just using HVAC will save roughly $350 billion annually uh, if you're doing the whole economy. And that would save roughly 50% of curtailments by using that technology um, instead of using HVAC. Um, Everything else in those two scenarios is identical, except the fact that we allow HVDC in one and not in the other. Um, and that just uh, shows you kind of the, <coughs> the decrease in losses, but also the, the way that you can actually use the resources better to back up each other um, as well. And we have roughly a capacity value of wind of 57% across the fleet um, in the US in this, in this scenario. And so finally, just to kind of wrap it up in, in some senses that all these studies keep coming out with this kind of the same findings. I think this group has seen this many times is that they, you get a decreased cost, you can help decarbonization. Uh, we may be able to help electrification, reliability can be enhanced. Um, I guess some of the newest stuff is you can really expand markets um, for better or for worse. You can really allow more actors to participate, particularly on the DER side, would if you have a much bigger market might be able to uh, start selling that power, these Internet of Things, having these HVDC lines, which, by the way, you can also transmit information across, um, can be used to actually help the Internet of Things. Um, and we keep going back to the HVDC VSC technology seems to be the winning technology over and over again on this with the higher voltages. Um, several reasons is one, obviously, you can move remote generation locally. Uh, you can also build it into a network rather than just being point to point. Um, and it also allows agnostic of technology it doesn't really care what you're putting into it as long as it moves it around uh, so from a political standpoint it's easier in that sense um, and then as uh, as we just heard if you have any problem with them going overhead you can go underground uh, with the technologies or along roads or railways um, but in my head sort of my previous career in in military starts flashing that we've got multiple infrastructures on top of each other which may be um, a national security risk but I'm pretty sure we can uh, mitigate that going, going forward. But I think state-to-state -state ties, rather than get, trying to go across many states, um, is kind of one of the things that we keep finding that will block a lot of long transmission lines if you try to go multiple states long, rather than trying to just do back-to-back. -back. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. And lastly, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Heinland, Senior Vice President of Engineering Services at the American Public Power Association. Good Thanks afternoon. Um, if you came expecting a PhD or a really cool accent, uh, that's not me. <laughs> I'm not just going to drop into French, German, English, or whatever. Uh, I was actually wondering why I'm here. And I look at Charlie's slide that said about the smart grid, but don't forget the dumb grid. Uh, I'm a Doug. For my utility guys, you know what a Doug is, right? I'm a dumb old utility guy. I've been in this business since 83. Um, I'm with the American Public Power Association. and We have 2,008 or so municipal utilities operating in the United States. But that also includes Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, Marianas Islands. Um, we are the original microgrid. We like to say that. We were 2,000 compact shining lights years ago. And um, as Sue Kelly, my CEO, says, been there, done that, have the t-shirt, don't want to go back. Because over time, we gave up our small coal plants due to environmental concerns. We got rid of a lot of our diesel. So we went from 2,000 units of light to depending upon this transmission system that we've built in the United States and we depend upon it greatly. So our interest in this conference is is 100% lockstep on how do we ensure that that transmission system meets the needs of those 2008 small munis. We do have some large municipalities and you're probably familiar with them because you see them at play. You'll hear about LADWP or SMUD, Austin, CPS Energy in San Antonio, New York Power Authority, Sandy Cooper. They have a tendency to own some transmission, but that number is about 117 utilities. So the other roughly 1,900 do not, and are relying upon a transmission system. I enjoy the word resilience because I don't think anyone's really defined it. 
So when I hear this resilience, this resilience, that, I was born and raised in Philly, okay? So the greatest thing to come out of Philly was Rocky, <laughs> right? Academy Award 1976 film. And I always look at resiliency this way. We all are in the scope of reliability and the reliability of Rocky is he gets in the ring, he knows what he's gonna do and he begins the fight. And if he's gonna harden, it keeps him from going down. He hardens himself and his system. Resiliency is the ability for him to get back up against Apollo Creed. That's resilience. It's the snap back mentality that someone may have or a system may have. We can't call the whole boxing industry resilience. We can't call the whole anything we do in derms, you, you talk about solar, wind, hydro, that that's resilience. It's not. You got to start defining what resiliency is. It's the ability to snap back when something goes wrong on our system. And, and it's huge for us because you can just look no further than right now what's happening in California. We have transmission lines being blacked out due to public safety. Well, some of the municipals that I represent are hanging on those transmission lines. So all of a sudden they don't have access to electrons. And they have schools and they have hospitals. And now they're sitting here re-looking at that idea of a microgrid. Now we need to bring back distributed generation to possibly meet the town. If it does not meet 100% of the town's load, what are we doing? Demand destruction. Anybody who's an old Doug knows that demand destruction is not where you want to go. Because the customers of those they're not on, who are operating at a certain less value, 50% of their production capability, are going to be yelling at the Doug. So we want to make sure that we have 100% of our customers served, regardless of whether it's commercial, industrial. I think when we talk about transmission, macro grids, micro grids, there are, there are two things that I didn't hear in the conversation. The first one is cost. Not once did I hear us talk about cost. In the municipal environment, we're nonprofit. We're trying to keep the lights on at the lowest cost we can, environmentally friendly, do it in a safe and secure manner. Second, cyber. I think it may be mentioned once. The more we start interconnecting this grid, whether it's at the transmission level, transmission to distribution, distribution to distribution, distribution to the customer, every time you put a new gadget where you want to look at that shiny new nickel, oh my gosh, I can have my cable TV connect to my car, you're adding an inject point for cyber. And that's something that keeps us up at night in the engineering field. Every time we connect, it's another injection point for the bad guys. So as we go forward, we need to keep that in mind. Every time we put one of these bells and whistles, phasers, whatever it may be on our transmission and or distribution system or customer system, that we have to have cyber front of mind. How do we protect ourselves from a mass attack? How do we protect ourselves from a regional attack, a local attack? So with that, I'll stop, Ryan. If you want to, I want to thank you for the invite for an old Doug. And, uh, Back to you. Doug, is that it? Or, or Doug? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So we're going we're gonna to do some uh, panel questions now, so please, uh, I'm going to kick off, but we look forward to questions from the... the I think about you know, a couple of examples can be a little bit about technology and the evolution and the, the enabling new markets. We heard the example with the PMUs, we've heard of the offshore wind with the feasibility with new HVDC voltage source <coughs> converter. But uh, what, what do you see are some of the barriers in the United States? We've, there was tremendous examples in Europe uh, and from China. You know, we're one country, uh, 50 states, uh, lots of uh, com competing uh, agendas within that. But what do you think are some of the barriers, barriers to uh, technology entry uh, really in the United States more so than it is today? I'll start at this end. Yep. Uh, what, what one of the things that we see regularly now is there is such rapid change in technology that the state regulators and the consumer owners of the public entities have a hard time catching up with so what's really going on what, what's what they don't they have a hard time getting the data and the tools to help evaluate a lot of the new technologies a lot of the state entities have a hard time sending people to training because their budgets are hit pretty hard during the last big recession so I, I, I think that we, I think technology is way out in front of the capacity of the system to figure out the right business model and the right regulatory innovation to make them happen. Uh, DOE tries to support that through te technical assistance, et cetera, but we have 50, 50 regulatory bodies in the states, plus then all the consumer owns who work through the NRECA or APPA and others. And 
I, I see that that's chronically the challenge. They just struggle to keep up with the data and the tools to help evaluate the business cases and the impact on consumers and benefits to consumers to deliver. Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, big barriers at the moment is just the awareness <coughs> in the industry that uh, this new technology is there. Uh, it's actually not brand new because it's gradual development over a long period of time. And, and uh, I, I think as awareness uh, increases, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, use of it because it obviously makes sense. You, you, you can't continue to, to work on permitting uh, line overhead lines for 10, 15 years and don't know the outcome. Uh, 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 at the end of the day, uh, there are a few examples in North America where, where uh, entities have gone out uh, trying to permit with uh, this technology and, and it has been a, a, a pretty uh, easy process and been done in a, in a couple of years instead of the, the 10 years that it typically takes for a traditional transmission line. So I think awareness is really the, the key. Mm -hmm. I think another element that enters in is, is the one of risk. I think utilities get, get compensated for keeping the lights on, not for taking risks and trying new technologies. So even if they want to, there's some risk associated with the new technology and they don't have real incentives to take on that risk. They'd, they'd rather just keep doing what they already know how to do, which is, has worked well for them. So. Mm -hmm. Chris? Yeah, I think some of the some of the barriers just inertia from those that have captive clients and audiences in terms of uh, where they're providing power, but also we're we're living on the back of some major projects that we've just been able to sort of band-aid over and and add to incrementally that, that's worked up until now. And I think um, the the fundamental shift in the technology is so big now that we're, we're almost at the cusp of it sort of breaking through and people realizing they're going to have to change how they're doing it, but the last decade or so we've just been able to sort of uh, yeah sort of add little incremental changes rather than the big changes that need to, need to come and so uh, it's just living off the back of big projects from 20 40 years ago I, I agree with everything that was said I, i'll just try to add on to that i think some of it's generational i i think it's it's a paradigm shift that has to happen if you look at and again i'll speak up for the dogs of the world i i look at a meter and I look at a 20 year or more asset when I came into this business. And now I'm being told it's a computer under glass and it's five years max. And, and that's no different than myself being brought up with a landline and that phone could last for my entire growing up in Philadelphia to now if you have a phone that's three, four years old, you're out of date. And I think the younger generation is, is, is more poised to accept new things. I, I look at your, your really cool watch here, and I know when I was given a watch for graduating university, I, I, was, I, I could wind it, and my father told me I could wear that until I retired. It was the way you did a watch. Now, if you don't get new software or update that, you, you need a new watch in two years, and my kids have them. I have three engineers. I have two electrical engineers and a civil engineer that, I, that I've raised, and their, their outlook on technology is way different than my outlook on technology. But unfortunately, right now, at, at many of the utilities, and this doesn't just be munis or co-ops or IOUs, whoever, it's, it's my age that's running the show. And, and that's gonna change as we, as we move forward, the acceptance of technology. We saw a lot of studies, uh, uh, you've referenced about technology. Do we, do we have the right tools? You know, they're, they're power systems analysis has been around for decades, moving into resilience, and you've talked about some of the things the DOE's doing, and some of the other studies that have been highlighted. Do we have the necessary tools uh, and models for, to, for today's development of the grid in America and Canada. Do you want to start at that end? Of sure. I, I sometimes wonder if we have too many models. Everybody has a model. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I love the, the grid lab consortium and everything that's going on in the modernization. DOE is a gem. I, I can't say this enough. APPA works closely with the Department of Energy in many areas, from mutual aid through the labs. And some of the modeling they do is awesome but sometimes that modeling doesn't get out to the end, the end utility. And that's something too, is the ability to, to transfer the models that we have out into the industry. So then we start making our own <coughs> models and then we have the contractors, consultants 
making their own models. Now we have the universities doing their own models. And next thing you know, we've got 27 models of what we should do. And we're not breaking it down into everybody getting on the same page and having a policy outlook of this is the model going forward. Yeah, I, I think um, I actually quite like, uh, maybe I'm biased, uh, building software, but uh, <laughs> there being lots of models, not, not just because of my own business, but because uh, it builds consensus, right? If lots of models say roughly the same thing in the same directionality, then we can have more confidence that that's the right thing, right? I can, I can build you a model today that can basically tell you anything you want. But if it says something completely different to all the other models, then someone should sit there and go, well, why is it doing that? Is it because you've made something up? Or is it because you've actually found something new, something that's emergent? And then as that gets looked at by all the other models and they're incorporating those ideas and is vetted, uh, if they find that that is wrong, then eventually it, it's, it's noted as wrong and we can move forward. But um, all models are incomplete. Um, the only real way we know whether a model is right is once we've deployed it and we're looking at it and using it. Um, but you can do a lot of work in a model and lots of models at l much lower cost and risk um, first before deploying things. Um, and I think we've done quite a lot of that already, so that's why we can have lots of wind and solar and now storage on the grid. Um, but as we go forward, I think the models we have today will look uh, ancient, just like the models that we look at from the 2000s look ancient today as well. I'm reminded of a, a, a saying that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. <laughs> so so <laughs> modeling is, is an art. Um, but when you look at the nitty gritty tools used for analyzing the grid, one of the trends that Roger mentioned was the increasing amounts of uh, voltage source converters, power electronic converters going into the HVDC systems. And as we look at the, the system of the future where it's mostly power electronic controlled grid with a lot of wind and solar and HVDC terminals and very weak systems electrically and very low inertia or no inertia systems, this uh, emerging idea of grid forming inverters and their controls is a very important one. And we do not have the tools, we do not have the models today to model a system that's got a very high penetration of grid forming inverters. So that's a very large modeling need, modeling challenge for the future. Another one that we're facing right now today, just with the uh, penetration of distributed energy resources in the distribution system, is trying to do stability studies, conventional stability studies that accurately, accurately reflect the way the DG is going to behave, especially with the addition of battery storage. The NERC now is leading an effort uh, to look at modeling um, the aggregated behavior of distributed energy resources and have stability studies that will give good answers reflecting the increasing amount of generation in the, in the distribution system. So I, I think it's an evolving, continually evolving area. I, I would agree with Chris that things, uh, the models we had 20 years ago aren't really sufficient for today and the models for today really won't be sufficient for 20 years from now. So it's a, continuing upgrading process that needs to be done. No, I don't think I have anything okay. to add to that. I agree with that. Uh, I think we have a bigger problem with data than models. We got a lot of great models. Data continues to be the chronic missing link. Uh, DOE is investing in some um, repositories that focus on energy storage or uh, demand response and other things. Some of that's real data, some of it is synthetic data to protect the sensitivities of the data. Uh, so I, I think that that is a important new trend to make more data available to the innovation community and to the small utilities and others who, who don't have access to some of the data sets. So I think that's the tougher nut to crack right now. Questions from the floor? Here we got one. Mr. Skelly, or Skelly as you're known, you're, you're famous now. Michael has been dropped. <laughs> so a uh, question for each of the panelists. What's the biggest thing that's going to, what's the biggest thing that's going to happen in the next five years that nobody's thinking about? So one thing, five years, you can say 10 years if you want, um, that people are underestimating. The one thing. One. Well, we, we, we hit a milestone this year on uh, organic flow batteries at about $250 per kW installed. So the price point's really dropping. 
I think the bigger challenge than getting the price point down on grid scale energy storage is the, uh, the balance of plant, the reliability of the balance of plant on energy storage. But the, the prices are really coming down fast. And I think that, uh, I don't know if it'll be five years, but I think there's gonna be some real transformative activities in that space. And it's not just for ancillary services, it's also I think can become a kind of a fundamental grid element to help handle some of the variability in the system that I think will really transform how we plan and design the systems for dark. So companies. instead of 250, what's your number per KW? Our target is uh, 120. And I think when we get down to that space and prove out the, the reliability, the balance of plant under real utility scale duty cycles, then I think you're gonna see some dramatic transitions to design and operations. Roger. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, energy storage, I think is- You have to come up with your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is my own thing. Man. That's European energy storage. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Skelly, when, when you asked the question, the first thing that popped into my head was energy storage, but <laughs> I'll, I'll say something different just to, to be, be different. Um, I think the participation of, of load, participation of demand response in the, uh, in the markets is potentially a major shift in paradigm and a, a major impact on the way we operate the system. I think with battery energy storage, wind and solar prices all dropping very, very dramatically, we're going to have an abundance of wind and solar. It's going to be times of massive curtailment that even all the transmission in the world won't, won't satisfy the, the need because there'll just be more generation available than there is load. And until we find uh, sources, other sources to utilize that, that excess energy, I, I think that, or maybe as a stimulus to find other sources, I think that zero marginal cost energy that we we're talking about is going to drive innovative ways for um, demand to participate in the markets and drive new loads, drive electrification, drive um, load growth. I've seen numbers of two times what we have today in the next 20 or 30 years. It could be three times if we really do a, a very uh, complete job of decarbonizing. So participation of demand in the markets and new forms of demand and even dispatching uh, load to meet available generation instead of dispatching generation to meet available load. I think that paradigm shift the next couple, well, maybe it's more decades than, than the years, but I think that's a big one coming up. Uh, for me, in the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, we're gonna see all the coal and gas facilities that exist in North America being converted into hydrogen production facilities um, using curtailed renewables to produce either renewable natural gas or liquid fuels or ammonia from basically from the hydrogen uh, because they all have nice water sources, it's fairly clean, fairly cheap um, and it will just mop up all the excess basically solar in the afternoon uh, to provide dispatchable power but also to electrify other sectors um, and I feel like that's one of the things that's going to in the next five to ten years is going to appear uh, like a freight train, just like solar did, just like storage, uh, battery storage will in the next couple of years. But I mean, hydrogen production will uh, at those facilities be at a scale we won't uh, believe uh, of the order of 50 to 100 gigawatts in the next 10 years. I, I won't say five years, but I'll look more at 10, Scully, and that is uh, small modular nuclear reactors. I think now that the NRC has approved the new scale that uh, Idaho National Labs is doing a project with one of our members, UAMPS, the Utah Association of Municipal Power Systems, um, you know, that's going forward. And I think the idea of having nuclear in 50 megawatt increments is a whole new look at nuclear. When you look at the, the plants that are struggling to be built right now, it's because of the size. And a lot of that goes away under the SMR future? 10 years, maybe? With, with that shiny new widget that uh, Michael uh, teed up there, uh, do we have the, the right framework to deploy at scale quickly in this country? Is there uh, the needs, and also from a, being a utility guy, that I think of that new, new shiny, shiny object, whether it be new batteries, and I would get 
thousands of miles of lines and hundreds of substations, uh, you know, it's going to take years, decades to install the new shiny uh, technology at every one of those facilities and have got aging infrastructure. What are there barriers to getting a much faster deployment of these new shiny widgets? Uh, are you going to go, Carl? Oh, please. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's, that's the role of Carl. Um, <laughs> well, no, I, I, I really believe, I think the Department of Energy, and I said it was a gem before, is to really pilot some of the things that need to come into play. They, they bring such power to the industry, inventing really neat stuff, and then deploying it in a pilot format is one of the great things about it. And then you need to work towards commercializing that. If it's something to actually be installed, especially the distribution level, um, whether we like it or not, it's not about whether it's better sometimes, it's about the relationship you have with the utility. I was just in Georgia, Alabama, and Michigan in the last 10 days, and I chatted with a lot of my members out there, the utility guys, and they were talking about just that. The, the vendor comes forward, says, I have a better widget, buy it, and that's not how it works. It's, do you know my kids' names? Have you gone to lunch with me? Do you know who I am? What makes my utility tick? You need to build that relationship. And unfortunately, that's not just a technology thing. That is a relationship which takes time. I was going to offer a couple insights. Um, DOE has some very successful public-private partnerships for demonstrating things. The North American Synchrophaser Initiative is one that aggregated 80 to 90 entities across the interconnectors to come together and understand the value propositions, understand the lessons learned and the challenges, et cetera. And I think that's been very productive over the years. I, did, I do think we are very tribal in this country. I, I have talked to, I won't say what flavor utility it was, but an Idaho utility says, I don't care what Duke Energy did. I need to do storage here <laughs> before I believe anything. And, and I see time and time again, the same demonstration being replicated, just a different company name in different parts of the country. So I think we could get much better at aggregating and sharing the lessons learned. DOE on the energy storage activity has a, a rather gold-plated, uh, non-assailable non evaluation process. Uh, and when, when we get people into that, it makes it more likely that someone in the Southeast will believe results that come from someone in the North uh, upper Midwest. And I think we could get a lot better at sharing those lessons learned, and I think that will shorten the time to adoption, because mm -hmm. get, get out of this demonstration mode and, and go to delivery quicker. Question? Yeah, the one technology that none of you mentioned, although there was a presentation that was very encouraging, is undergrounding transmission. And the big hurdle for transmission is the land use impact, the aesthetic impact, the the overhead intrusion that it represents. But I always heard, well, you could build it underground, but it's an order of magnitude more expensive. Now I'm gathering it may not be an order of magnitude more expensive going forward. It may be competitive um, even in rural areas because the, 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 the land use cost itself is, is lower or what have you. Is, I mean, that I think would revolutionize the problem of getting transmission built if we could build it underground as, as cheaply as overhead. Is that going to happen? Yeah, I, I, I believe there are already examples of, of, of that. Uh, uh, the company I work for, ABB, we built uh, a, a completely underground system in Australia, 100 uh, miles long approximately uh, uh, in 2002. And uh, uh, that, that uh, f for that location, that was actually the lowest cost alternative. If, if you consider the, the, the overall cost of projects, including what it would take to, to uh, go through the permitting process for building an overhead line. So, so the answer is yes, if you look at the, the, the total cost, you can certainly do it competitive in, 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 uh, in some areas. Uh, I, I think part of what happened in, in North America is people tend to compare cost of underground grounding in densely populated areas with the cost of overhead construction in rural areas. And of course you will get that cost differences then uh, because nobody ever considered so far to, to, to build underground in, 
in the rural area, but, but if you do a cost analysis on that, uh, uh, I, I think you are certainly competitive. I mean, part of it is technology driven because it's not until the last four or five years that you have had uh, capacity ratings and underground systems where they are now and, and you know the, the construction cost, the trenching is the same whether you put in a 200 megawatt line or a 2000 megawatt line you still need to, to dig a trench. So, so with the higher capacity rating uh, uh, that, that now is available I, I certainly think it's a, it's a competitive alternative. I just wanted to add on the, the cost, I think the cost estimates you're hearing are typically in the distribution. To, to look at a distribution line, I could tell you the price of a pole, what I pay for wire to build a mile at 100000 For me to do that downtown DC, it, it's a whole different animal of costs. We're talking vaults, you know, you're talking conduits, multiple ones. Uh, the other thing about overhead underground from an old utility guy is I can't see that down there. In distribution I can see up there so when I'm sending my line crews out it's very quick to see what the problem is because a tree came down the line if I have a fault underneath I need to figure out a way to measure it drain it's so whatever I'm gonna do to find out where that fault is And you can put fault indicators they don't always work so it's not only more costly it's also the outages become more of an issue for us but I think uh, uh, you're gonna see more discussion on cable with the offshore uh, they're clearly the undersea cables are gonna come onto the land but there's going to be definitely need for more underground cables to get it from the, the land base uh, uh, cable joints uh, to the, the, near, the nearest substation or uh, uh, other undergrounding uh, to, to address that. Yes? When you look at the uh, obstacles to a high voltage direct current network, uh, how important is the political opposition to renewables and the competitive opposition to a big high voltage network from uh, incumbent uh, energy companies that are going to be facing a lot of uh, new competition. Are these significant factors in delaying the consideration of HVDC? Uh, not in my experience. I, I, I think what, what is delaying the big overlay is how, 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 do you, how do you distribute the cost for that? Who is paying for it? Uh, I, I think when it comes to more point-to-point, -point, meaning a long generator connector, uh, uh, the, I, I don't see any any significant opposition from from uh, the traditional utility companies. They, I, I think everybody is looking at how do we get transmission built, and and the big obstacle seems to be the permitting and and undergrounding and and using waterways as a way of, of getting around. That. Could I ask any other panelists that want to weigh in? I'll take a crack at the other part of your question on renewable political opposition to renewables. When I think of Skelly's effort to build those four lines, I think about the uh, maybe relative ease is not the right word, Skelly, but compare the, the amount of difficulty of getting a gigawatts of wind capacity built in Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, whatever, wherever the end of the lines were, compared to building the HVDC lines. I think the there's no comparison. I think you can build, and there's money waiting to build the, uh, the renewables, um, and, and it'll be done much easier than it will be to build the, the, the transmission. Yeah I, yeah, I just wanted to say that from the, the standpoint of um, the network, I think um, we've had some success with people um, from both sides of the parties uh, being attracted to it because it's agnostic to technology. Um, I think the, the long distance lines made it more difficult for them in their head. That's kind of the concept of HD, VDC they have is, oh, my state's going to miss out possibly. Uh, we're just going to be a pass over state. Um, so that's difficult to get over. And I think the utilities now are more um, aligned with it because they're pretty much all seeing in the near future, in the next five years or so, excess generation. And they all want to have out of system sales, I think they call it, or you know, they want to be able to sell that power. And uh, it's a way for them to be able to uh, to do that. Um, and no matter what grid you have, um, I, I want more renewables, that's what I would like to see. But even with gas and coal and nuclear and other technologies, it's more efficient with a, a super grid uh, overlay. So 
uh, there's no um, opposition for that. So the most difficult part is, um, and what we found opposition to was just, we assumed over headlines in all of our studies. Um, uh, even though they're much smaller footprint than AC lines, that, that was the main hurdle we had to get over. And now um, uh, we've learned that the costs are now um, comparable to, to just going underground. So um, if we can do that um, and convince them of that, then I think uh, there, there should be a lot easier, a lot less um, opposition. Yes. Um, I'm wondering with, why is undergrounding more uh, attractive in terms of uh, land owners? Uh, it seems to me just you know, dig, the amount of digging up you have to do is just as disruptive. Is it just a matter of the overhead lines are ugly to look at? That that's why landowners oppose them so much? The, the mm-hmm. I, can, I can only speak to the distribution level, and, and yes, it's what, what they can see. Right, I can directional bore thousands of feet. I don't know if you've ever done directional boring, but the landowner's not going to see any of it. I'm going down with my machine and I'm shooting, right? We do it all the time underneath highways. We'll go through fields and then it's popping out, you know, a thousand yards away. And then I'm connecting my next one to it, all right? It's called porpoising. And then I'm shooting again. And you'll go miles of that line being underground and no one's going to see it, except where you're porpoising up and then shooting your next line, which is way different and coming in and, and ditch witching and trenching a line right through their property. That's when you really tick them off. Or if you put the lines in their sight line, they like to look out at their beautiful oak and the mountain in the distance, and all of a sudden you have a 34, 5 kV distribution line there, they're gonna be unhappy. Yeah, there is another factor that is very important also that uh, you know, often when you try to permit new overhead lines, you go through areas that were uh, previously undisturbed and, and uh, uh, by, by using an underground solution you can you can uh, uh, site the line in existing corridors such as you know roadways or railroad corridors or an existing overhead line corridor uh, uh, that that is not an, an issue and that 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 is a very important aspect in the permitting uh, typically in addition, of course, to, to the visual impact, nobody likes to see transmission lines for some strange reason. We're maximizing, utilities are maximizing their right of ways and we're trying to put more down the same corridor because that's land or we've got an easement or right of ways that we own. We've talked about putting more capacity and we've talked about resilience, uh, f- uh, physical security. Uh, how would you react to them from a technology perspective? We've understanding resilience isn't fully uh, uh, consistently defined. We understand reliability. What do you see are some of the technologies beyond undergrounding that are going to help resilience given that utilities are going to be using more of the existing right of ways to do, to do more with that because we already have the, the, the rights to build and operate assets? Jim, like to I'll just add one of the things that we're doing on mutual aid right now is we're starting to see more drones. I'll just throw that as one thing we are, mm-hmm. we are doing. Um, we flew a drone team from the Air Power Authority down to Puerto Rico. And that drone team went out and took a look at everything. We're seeing more and more of our members getting into drone technology, whether they're doing it themselves or they're working with a university or a consultant. And we're using it to, to look at it on blue sky days, black sky days, major. That way you don't have to put a helicopter in the air because it could be too windy. You may be able to stay low along the tree line and be able to see your down poles in a right away. The one thing I would offer in terms of resilience, and I, and I think the National Academy did a really nice job of defining resilience. They just didn't do a very good job of communicating that because no one seems to think there's a definition for resilience, but they, they basically reflected yours, Mike, which is one, you avoid the, the insult in the first place, but if you do get taken out, you recover very quickly with a very minimal uh, impact zone. And, and I think a lot of the, the, the potential around system observability it's going to let us extract a lot more productivity out of existing corridors and existing conductors mm-hmm. where you have real-time line rating and other things that will deliver a lot of economic value of existing conductors that we're not touching today. But it's also going to help us avoid potholes. We're going to be able to be much more predictive on our tools to steer around issues, whether it's voltage management or other things, that's going to make us stay up. Now, that's not a physical insult like a hurricane or something like that. 
but I think that's going to really enhance the resilience of existing conductor and assets uh, and enable us to do as much as we can in what we already have and then be smarter about what new stuff we plan for going forward. Any questions from the... My last question that I had, and it will, we'll, uh, we'll finish a few minutes early to for the break, was, so artificial intelligence, you know, uh, it's been around for a couple of decades, it's now gaining a lot of traction. Uh, what areas do you see that uh, for the transmission space of, of using AI uh, more so in our, or perhaps operations, maintenance, uh, what's, what, what, off, what can you offer in terms of the use of AI? Uh, two, two things jump out, and you know, I, was, I, I lived through the first two failures of AI in my career, uh, but what's really different this time is the computation and the size of the data sets now make it very compelling in certain applications. Uh, and we found, I think, dramatic value uh, both in anomaly detection related around physical and cybersecurity on both the IT and the OT sides. Uh, and I think we're gonna, it's gonna just transform the ability to watch for incipient failures and do predictive maintenance requirements uh, in ways that we've never been able to capture before. The challenge is the data sets are huge. Where the, the DOE efforts are finding a lot more productivity out of physics-informed AI as opposed to just the sort of Google approach which is, says throw, throw algorithms at a big data set and see what comes out. Physics and foreign is being very productive and DOE is crafting some platforms of software and hardware platforms that can handle the speed and, and volume of data that utilities are gonna face. And we're working with vendors to try to help make sure that they're able to extract from that things they can use in their tools. So I think you're gonna see a lot of rapid uptake and support of anomaly detection and predictive maintenance and, uh, and, and imminent failure uh, detection on the bulk system. Good. I think forecasting um, is an area that's ripe for some applications of AI. Looking at renewable energy forecasting, weather forecasting, uh, load forecasting, um, congestion forecasting, congestion management, so in operations. I'm reminded of a particular uh, forecasting uh, application called analog, analog Ensemble. With an analog ensemble, instead of having a whole lot of members of the ensemble, you just have one, an event. But then you go back and you search through a database for other days where conditions were similar to the, the forecasted event that's coming up. And with that, you put together an ensemble and you get a much better idea of what to expect from uh, a single point forecast in the future. I think that can be extended to a lot of operating forecasts. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to thank the panel for a really robust discussion around technology uh, for the, the modern grid. We're uh, very excited by what lies ahead. We've got a lot of work to do, but uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for, uh, for his <laughs>